Hi folks, welcome to Walking on the Ween Side, part of It Matters Radio. Today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Margaret Panofsky. She is the author of this book. It is called The Last Shade Tree. It's brought out by my publisher, All Things That Matter Press, a delightful house out of Maine. And uh, Margaret, I'm particularly interested and delighted to have you here today because just this past weekend, I had occasion to go to a concert of uh, Renaissance French music. And of course, you are a musician and you play the viola de gamba, which is a Baroque and Renaissance instrument. And folks, just so you understand, it's more, it's closer to the cello than it is really to the viola, even though the name makes it sound different. And uh, we'll be talking, I think, a little bit about music with you. Uh, and, and also, I know you have a, a background in dance. So we'll be talking. And, and part of the reason I, I want to talk about those things is that I have to tell you, The Last Shade Tree really reminded me, as I was reading it, uh, of music. In fact, at times I would just put it down and think to myself about modern ballet. I would imagine, you know, things that I have seen on stage, particularly, I, I, I somehow it elicited Stravinsky, who was certainly not a Baroque musician. No, when I was writing the book, I made actually an effort not to bring early music into the novel. I went as um, early as Bach, J.S. Bach, but I refuse to have anything earlier than that mm -hmm. because I find it to not be that about myself. Mm -hmm. But no one writes a novel that isn't about themselves in many ways. Right. Yeah, every book reflects who we are as people as right. we write it. So what do you, how would you describe the genre of The Last Shade Tree? Well, this is a very hard question and it certainly bothered all the agents who read it because it doesn't fit in any genre well, but I would say um, science fiction and fantasy. And, but when people actually read the book and, and sent in comments and reviews, they mainly just talk about the personalities of the characters and how uh, well-rounded they are. So I think if people are seeking out fantasy in particular, science fiction in particular, they will be surprised because they won't find a stereotypical book. No, it certainly is not typical of a genre. I would add a word to your mm -hmm. um, fantasy and science fiction. I would add surrealism. Yes, mm -hmm. and magic realism. And magical realism too, yeah. But uh, I... I, I think, I think personally, uh, again, you know, I, I found uh, very much, and, and I tend to be, even though I'm a writer, I'm, I'm fairly visual and music and, dance, you know, I'm into those things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me uh, about it was I, along with ballet, I could imagine the painter Magritte. Magritte, of course. Yes. Not Dolly, folks. Magritte. Dolly it pushes it in your face. Magritte is a much more subtle surrealist. Uh, well, I also come from an art history family. Mm -hmm. And so I can't help but uh, write without putting in an awful lot of references to uh, classical things. Mm -hmm. It's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. So the Magritte doesn't surprise me because uh, I tend to do Magritte-like art. Okay, well, there we go, yeah. So I'm, I'm seeing you in this book, I'm seeing your, your artistic nature in the book, and I think, I hope, 
you're taking it as a compliment because it's being offered as a compliment. <laughs> it's, it's a tremendous compliment. I mean, one thing I didn't think about at all uh, until this moment is how a reader would see almost pictures in their own minds as they're going along of maybe other arts, dance and, or music, or, you know, almost like hearing something at the same time as they read. That's what happens when I read. But I never imagined it would happen to other people. Of course, so I hope it is. I mean, and especially in this novel where people are basically floating, not in limbo, but in a kind of gossamer haze of reality. It is a little bit of a gossamer haze, isn't it? Yeah, very much. So what inspired you to write The Last Shade Tree? All right, now this is a, a kind of a silly <clears throat> story. This is the factual part of the inspiration. I uh, had a rather drastic occurrence at the age of 15. Our family was coming back from Europe uh, on the polar route and two of the engines on the plane went out. And so it was scary. And we had to make an emergency landing at Frobisher Bay. And uh, it's the middle of winter. <clears throat> there were northern lights and all that sort of thing. And um, in the end, the problem couldn't be fixed. And we sort of lived to Seattle. We were supposed to go all the way to San Francisco. And uh, it made it a um, rather remarkable impression. I would think. So, right. And so, a uh, former Shubik is now uh, Iqaluit, which is the um, Inuit name for it. It is on Baffin Island, way up near the, um, I think it's past the Arctic Circle, actually. Mm -hmm. It's going on up towards the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, then I had this friend from college. And I lost sight of him for years and years and years. And then we started up a email correspondence maybe a few years ago. And he let me know that he was actually in Frobisher Bay himself as um, a CBC correspondent for a couple of months. So he said, OK, I have a challenge for you. I want you to write a book. I want you to have the characters meet in Frobisher Bay at age 15 when you were there age 33 when I was there, um, and I want you to also have them in their normal ages. So I said, I can't do that without time travel. I said, okay, well, time travel. He's an, he's an author, so he figured he would give me a challenge because he wanted me to write. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So that's how the book started. <laughs> what, what inspired me to write it was, uh, Sounds very prosaic, but I just wanted to express myself in a way that was not music. Uh -huh. Well, that's a good reason, too, to change kind of media in that way. Now, I think that those are the, the you know, you just gave two different reasons for writing the book. Mm -hmm. both, both meaningful, and I'm sure both true. One is a friend challenging you mm -hmm. to draw on this unique knowledge that you have of this place. I think, you know, that, okay, we can get you started with the place, but also having to still deal with, I'm sure, what was a tremendously traumatic and, and at the same time, startlingly exciting experience. I remember the first time I saw the Northern Lights and it wasn't anywhere near that far north, but I mean, it just blew my mind. The They're stunning, stunning okay. beauty and, and the sense of, of the Earth's power and the fact that suddenly, I, I think in a way I had never really understood before, that we are all traveling on this giant spaceship. Yeah, we are. Yeah, and, and, and that the Northern Lights really Click that home for me. So on the one hand, you're dealing with that heightened experience of age 15, and, and on the other, your friend kind of challenging you. Okay, now let's see what you can do with a, a pen. So, 
That's exactly what happened, yes. But I, I, of course, as a shrink in my previous life as a shrink, uh, I'm more interested in the trauma and all. And when I read The Last Shade Tree, which is the book we're talking about today, folks, just to remind you, um, Margaret, I, I wondered, what did you want people to take away about the meaning of life from this book? Because it's also, it is surrealistic. It is this journey inward at the same time that it's out, which to me is what surrealism is. It's the merger of the inward experience with the outward world. The, the character, um, Ariel Sequoia, he has more than a few names throughout the book. Yes. His growth as a human being is on two journeys. Uh, he's a tremendously challenged child because he's in a, a boarding school, Cherokee boarding school. And uh, he progresses through life often bumbling along, has terrible things happen to him. But as he's on an exterior journey that goes way, way past the earth we know, he's also on an interior journey to find not only himself, but also his heritage, which he loses in the boarding school. So that at least is what my uh, character does. And I think for myself, okay, I'm Jewish. And I spent my whole life not really finding my roots. And I would never assume to associate the two because um, my character is not me, truly. But I think that's why he developed as he did. And the, the message I'm taking away is the or giving, I guess, is the importance of uh, pursuing your own journey, um, no matter how impossibly difficult it is. And um, in a more prosaic way, once again, uh, I chose episodes for the journey because I was so horrified that I didn't learn about them in school, all those atrocities. So that's why those come up through the time travel. Um, so that, and I wanted to learn about them, and I, and that's why they're there. I hope that answer is all right. So how, how you talking? We're talking about a book here that is about discovering who one is, and by discovering who one is, to better understand all the pain that has gone before. Now, before we take a break, I, I want to point out Sequoia is a Native American and the boarding school he goes to is one of the Indian schools. Right. It's, it's actually a real school and it wasn't one of the worst schools. Um, and it um, exists today in a new form as uh, the um, Cherokee Nation's Sequoia High School, which is a very fine high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I have a new book coming out from All Things That Matter Press in the near future called Red and White, and that character mm -hmm. also went to one of the Indian schools. He acted, the main character of that, he actually was in the one of the very first years of the Carlisle School, which is, of course, the first of the Native American schools. Uh, and it was a much less horrific experience then. I mean, it was bad enough, but it got worse as this whole system developed and Pratt became less involved with it. It really went downhill and downhill and downhill. Um, but yeah, did you go to a boarding school? I did not. Okay, I did. So, yes, yeah, which is one of the reasons I personally wanted to include boarding school. But, folks, we'll be right back to talk, talk some more with my guest today, Margaret Panofsky, the author of The Last Shade Tree from All Things That Matter Press. The Last Shade Tree, a novel by Margaret Panofsky, tells a story about extraordinary people intensely bound together on a journey to unexpected places. 
where even time is skewed. Sequoia, a gentle hero, lives on the edge of reality where clairvoyant thought is as natural as breathing, but he's been damaged by a terrible childhood. Soon, he hits rock bottom, a victim of his own despair in an uncaring world. Then, through his terror, Sequoia saw Miriam drift toward him, her feet barely skimming a path of stars glittering like the Milky Way, and suddenly everything was all right. Her features were placid, her eyes gentle, her flesh rosy and warm. Her luxurious black hair blew across her breast as the billowing white dress sucked him close, wrapping him in its folds. He let himself fall. Sequoia died, or thought he did. Why then? Was he still conscious, hovering over his own bloody and broken body that lay on the screen beside the lake? In this tale of self-discovery, Sequoia finds himself and his humanity while suspended between life and death. He is not alone. Alita, a beautiful violinist, Ethan, neurotic physics student, Luz, ROTC instructor, and Yaroslav and Anichka from the Slovakian Alps join him to sweep across millennia by breaking the barrier of time. The Earth's magnetic field and the Northern Lights, particularly strong this far north, would power the vehicle. In conjunction with 14 interconnected mines, with humanity's existence in jeopardy, their journey is labyrinthine and disaster filled, their mission as daunting as Ulysses returning home from Troy, as Moses and the Israelites parting the sea. They stumble as often as they succeed, they fight. They love as passionately as they hate, and children with supernatural gifts are born. Who can understand the power of love? She started running her hands up and down my spine, and I did the same to her. She became music under my touch. We joined together like twin vines, so interlocked we could not separate the shoots from the flowers. Who are these people? Perceptive, bigger than life, but lost, as conflicted as you and me? Margaret Panofsky's The Last Shade Trees, deadly serious and darkly comic, Part fantasy, part historical, part science fiction, a spectacular family epic and love story that unites three generations. Welcome back, folks, to Walking on the Ween Side. So I just told Margaret Panofsky, my guest today, about that I had gone to boarding school. And, uh, you know, because I wanted, yeah, our books in some ways are similar, but I, mine is historicized fiction, and yours is this really fantastical, surrealistic kind of journey uh, that takes people around the world. They actually end up in the middle of where? It ends up a million years in the future because um, it's actually an apocalyptic novel. Mm -hmm. And then about the middle, in 2050, um, the world finally manages to destroy all humanity. And uh, so a plot has meanwhile been afoot 
to get people into the future past the devastation. And that's the more or less the end of the journey. Mm-hmm. Or it could be the beginning of the journey if there's a sequel. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, also, though, they're, they're going back and forth in time. Time travel is going on continuously through the novel. Right, there's a lot of uh, fluidity in time. Mm-hmm. Not only um, some of the um, main young characters, but also the people who uh, make all this happen. And yet those are the true villains. The moon people were actually comic figures. Yes, they are. Um, when, in my youth, there was a a mania for building um, your own um, fallout shelter. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, no through underground and um, in your backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, and my father, who was a nuclear physicist, thought I was pretty stupid because nothing would really help. Mm-hmm. It was an all out war. So I, <clears throat> I put them in to a, an orbiting satellite as an alternative to the underground uh, fallout shelter. And uh, they're also clairvoyant, as all the other characters are over down on the Earth. And they're manipulated by the moon people. They're an old elderly couple. And at one point in their um, jaunting around and being sort of pests, they go forward and they witness World War III. And so it totally shakes them up, and they decide they have to solve uh, this problem of, of um, bringing humanity back you know, for the future. So that's the basic uh, plot outline and the reason for this journey. Well, you know, that brings up a very interesting philosophical point. Yeah. You know, uh, if you are, as I am, a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, you know, you ask yourself the question, if this earth were to be destroyed, who should be rescued? And should it be humans, first of all? Are any humans, you know, worthy of that? And of course, in Hitchhiker, it's the dolphins. I have my own hierarchy of dolphins who are above humans, but then so are orangutans and bonobo. And I'm not sure, but maybe lowland gorillas. Manatee, maybe. Or um, octopuses. Octopus, yeah, absolutely. They're among, certainly. Parrots are uh, are wonderful. I'm sorry? Parrots. Oh, parrots. Parrots, like, some parrots are fabulous and great sense of humor. Crows are rather magical animals as well. I, I mean, I think that one reason to not have humans uh, is because they have such a dreadful ability for self-destruction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, mm-hmm. Just, and such a willingness to, self, to destroy one another. You know, I mean, most, most animals have, even if they're very territorial and fight, they have mechanisms built in where, like dogs, you know, the dog flies on its back, urinates in the air, and and the other dog says, okay, you've had enough. Humans, we don't have that capacity. We don't, you know, once we're wailing on the other guy, we, especially men, you know, once we're wailing, I mean, and everybody's cheering us on. I mean, you know, uh, in school as a kid, you know, uh, if you remember, the kids had started duking it out, and everybody, had, fight, fight, fight. I remember it very well. Yeah, what's wrong uh, with us that we treat one another that I, way? I don't know. Because in the end, it will be our, you know, we're extraordinarily brilliant and uh, seem to be so very good at thinking up of ways to destroy ourselves, that's all. And they, um, I don't hold out a great deal of hope, especially right now. I don't want to get into all that. <laughs> no, but yeah, no. But uh, yeah, you know, it is very, and of course, this interview, we're doing it in the season of hope, as it were. Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, uh, all, all holidays of hope. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, 
the, the Eid is not among the holidays right now because that is another from the Muslim world. But you know, three of the three major religions having this, the, or, or cultures having this season of hope, and then the new year and all the promise that brings, and, and yet reality is that it's very hard to hope when we look at humanity. And we wonder who who would you put? And certainly the characters you put in that satellite, they don't deserve to be. <laughs> and that's the irony of the book. <laughs> I don't think they intend to move on. I mean, that's their satellite is extremely limited, limiting, and that's why they are trying to find people who are uh, better equipped to go into the future which is uh, what they do. Um, but they are kind of crazy, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very humorous characters, but also the irony that, that even, you know, sometimes we say, well, if you're going to put together this crew for this spaceship, I and mean, you know, there have been shows that have created on that premise, television shows and movies. Okay, we're putting together the people who will represent mankind going forward when the earth ends, uh, who do you put on it? Who really, and, and are any of us worthy? And how do you decide? These are questions, and you kind of, in your book, by the very nature, challenge us in a rather unique way, because your characters who are to be saved, your, your characters to be saved, are not necessarily the most brilliant, they're not the great physicians, they're not the great engineers, they're not the computer gurus. They have something else. What is it that you gave them, make them making them worthy of saving? Well, I think the very fact that they have flaws is what makes them wonderful people. Mm -hmm. um, Otherwise, when you're writing uh, science fiction or fantasy, your characters really tend, up, tend to be caricatures of human beings. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I actually did succeed in making three-dimensional people because all of them are compromised. Four-dimensional, yes. because you gave them something more, something uh, intuitiveness, clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. why, why did you go with that? What were you? That's a good question, but I don't believe in it myself. You don't believe but in it yourself? I don't personally believe that clairvoyance exists. That's why we were given mouths to, to open and shut them and communicate from one person to the next, not through thoughts. But, you, but wait, wait a minute now. Whoa, I you communicate with people beside words. Well, this is, this is what I was trying to do. It's the same as the kind of uh, communication that comes when you hear music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or see something extraordinarily gorgeous. Art, dance, or just the feelings you get from people as you say pass them on the street. Mm -hmm. Or um, when you're in love with somebody those kind of waves that go from one to the other. And that's a type of clairvoyance. It just doesn't go as far as actually reading thoughts. Mm -hmm. So um, what I think is interesting about the clairvoyance I gave these people is all of them use it differently. And uh, it's not necessarily a gift. In many cases, it's torture for them. So that gives it another dimension as well. Oh, yes, and your characters do not experience it as an unallayed gift. They do experience a lot of pain from their it, awareness of others. And I think that that struck me as what made them worthy of redemption and mm -hmm. salvation, that they were able to be aware of pain and flaw and struggle and not just be, oh, I'm the best, I'm the bigliest. I know, I do get tired of that. So tell me, this. I'm going to ask you a question now. Of course. Um, okay, so I got various reviews 
from people. And some people saw the book as, as quite optimistic at the end, and that took me, believe it or not, totally by surprise. But more than half the people who read it thought it was an optimistic book. So tell me what you think. Do I think I, it's optimistic? Not particularly. I think that it raised for me the question of is humanity worthy of saving? And my answer, like yours, is not particularly. As I said, I have a lot of other species. But I think that in the end, some of us individually, because we can be sensitive to and aware of others, maybe can redeem our species if we get the chance. I, yes, I think that's what I was trying to say. Um, what did you think about the second set of gill ones? Those prairie dogs. Um, I, I really don't, I didn't have a particular thought that comes to my mind. I have to tell you, I read the book months ago, so. Oh, well, they were the, um, the totalitarian, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose you'd say they were the, the animals that took over the world when there were no people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what the, um, our, our, um, the people on our journey meet are these prairie dogs, mm -hmm. and they're awful. Mm -hmm. They're just as bad as any uh, human totalitarian, totalitarian society could be. But they're they're funny too. I mean, they're also slightly satirical yeah, well, creatures. Let me, let me ask you: when you talk about a totalitarian, mm -hmm. uh, do you ever occur to you that they, total, there's a benevolent despot? Right. Well, I think my villains in both cases have an altruistic side. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that on purpose uh, because um, it, it gives them um, much more shape in reality. Mm -hmm. Just having totally evil uh, characters really gets to be boring in about five minutes. So. Um, I think, I think that, you know, what you're talking about in, in this kind of rigid kind of, you know, has to be our way kind of society, I, I think of what's going on in China right now, but that takes us awfully far afield from your book, but where China is becoming in its own way more democratic because it fears democracy in order to keep the threat under control that the people are going to rise up. They're becoming more democratic in a lot of ways. I I think that I, I'm not a fan of despotism and certainly not a fan of, of its evils, but I am a fan of the idea that out of the Leviathan grows the community. That if you have people, and, and maybe that's Part of what the hope is in your book is that as things go badly, people might start recognizing ways that they have to change things. It's kind of like the, one of the myths of Stephen Harrison, the phoenix rising from the ashes. Right. And, and uh, there's, so that there is a renewal and of course the phoenix is a symbol of the sun because the sun disappears every night and comes back up in the morning. I mean, you hope so anyway. Um, and one of the, my characters is named Phoenix actually um, for that reason as a symbol of hope. And so yes, I think people put up with just so much and then they protest. It's just, well, they protest Soon enough, will things get fixed soon enough before something very really terrible happens? So, okay, folks, we're going to be right back with Margaret Panofsky after this.
Welcome back to Walking on the Lean Side. Margaret, uh, before we close up the show today, there are a few things that I really have to talk about a little bit with you. Because, well, the first one is people have to find your book. And the <laughs> easiest way, of course, is to go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble online, order it. You can order it in Kindle. You can order it in Nook. But, and, of course, you can order print. But uh, can, do you have a website that people can visit? Yes, and this is a super, super website. It has so much information on it that you, I would say you would have to read the book. Um, it is uh, www.nastshadetree.com. Okay, Last Shade Tree. Now the book is titled is The Last, Last Shade Tree, but the website yeah, is just Last Shade Tree. Right, and one nice thing about this website is it has a list of characters, in particular the children, because I have been informed that people are a little overwhelmed by the uh, Russian novel uh, sort of huge number of characters. I never had trouble keeping them short, but they say, oh my god, all the names start with A. Mm -hmm. And they do, but um, so there's a little uh, list and you can actually uh, print it out and cut it out like a bookmark. Uh -huh. and, and it's quite a comprehensive website. Okay. has a lot of my memes on it, too. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the other thing, I, I wanted to make sure we, we do justice to the other part thing you're involved in, which is that you have a musical group that you have lead. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. It's called the Tears of the Muses. Only Tears is spelled with an E. It's from a, a, an Elizabethan poem about the Muses, which is a very long and very boring. But <clears throat> the group is more or less affiliated with New York University. Um, it, but it is a professional group. Mm -hmm. And as soon as students become really wonderful viola da gamba players, they're in the group. Mm -hmm. And put out some CDs, always of the most unusual music that we can find. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's an absolutely wonderful experience. I have actually some um, students coming tonight. And we'll just sit there and we'll play all these amazing English Renaissance composers. and. And it's, it's, it just puts you into another realm, really. It's, how, it's, how, can it's, people, how can our listeners hear some of that music? Are they YouTubes? Or? Um, well, um, the CDs, one, one CD is called Fine Lemline. That's L-A-M. Um, wait, let me just check the feed here. Uh, double M, L-E-I-N, and there's an M loud over the A. And the uh, group is the Tears of the Muses. The other is um, called Narozeni Pana Krista. That's a Christmas CD. And uh, the music is from Bohemia in the 17th century. <clears throat> and, it's, and it's lovely. It has all these uh, songs, and we've done improvisations, uh, instrumental improvisations between the verses. And, and there's a mass on there. Um, and they're available through either CD Baby or on Amazon. Switch cheaper on CD Baby. I would go for CD Baby. Um, okay. And then, there, and we're also on uh, YouTube and Spotify and all that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, oh, cool. okay. Now, you started younger. You you danced, and I know you you kept dancing till you know fairly recently. Uh, you play music, and specifically Renaissance medieval music. You mm -hmm. write. Right. What else? Just... Hmm? Yes. What else? What other areas of artistic expression do you have? Okay. My, my feeling about my youth is that I was always doing everything too late. So when I started ballet, I was 11 or 12, and that's already too late. So I made this sort of desperate attempt to, to be a professional dancer and failed at it. 
So I think I ended up being too, too short. I mean, you have to be over five feet, which is my height. Uh, I was the right sort of general dimensions the other way, but too short. Mm-hmm. So um, in desperation, I went into music. But okay, I was now I was starting music too late. Because if you're smart, you would have already been playing that string instrument since you were five. So, and I was 20. So um, I worked very, very hard. And the early music field was just opening up then, so it was a little easier to enter it. Um, and I have loved and adored the viola da gamba my whole life. Uh, and always taught and played. Right now I'm a professor at New York University teaching. Um, but then it comes the art. And uh, I think art takes practice like everything else, and I'm out of practice. So I mainly just make Magritte-style memes for um, various social media, which I kind of half despise. Um, and I also was an art history major. Mm-hmm. That about covers it. That's enough. Okay. And are you going to write another book? I absolutely am. I'm about a third through the sequel. A sequel to the I really do meet these people in limbo. Mm-hmm. Okay. And things are all rather tragic and horrible, and, but there is a way out. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what the readers of the sequel will discover. Mm-hmm. Well, when you write it, uh, you gonna are you gonna use the same publisher, uh, friends at all things that matter press? Well, I certainly hope they'll like it. Okay. Because I love I love them. Yes, aren't they wonderful? They're a wonderful press. Yeah, they are and uh, you know, it happened I happen actually to have had the most people who publish with all things that matter never meet Phil and Deb. But I being a New Englander originally, was up in Maine a few years ago and went out to, to dinner with them. And in person, they actually embody all of the wonderful qualities that you would expect given dealing with them in their business. And also, give it, if you've read any of Phil's work himself. You know, these are people who are incredibly concerned with things that matter. And I think they, a lot of the time, the books that they publish really reflect that sense that this person is somehow writing about what matters. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why they really have been very eager uh, to have the world read The Last Shade Tree. I know uh, Deb particularly, you know, said to me, you know, wrote an email to me that she really thought it was an important book. And I think in some ways it is a very important because it does make us ask questions about what makes a human being worthy, what it is to be human, and how we can hope to survive in the face of our own very self-destructive quality as a species. Mm -hmm. I also think that I bring up a lot of uh, issues from the century that I was mainly writing in, which was the late uh, 20th, that are especially important today because history has an unfortunate way of repeating itself if people aren't paying attention. But I didn't want to hit people over the head with it. I don't like to lecture. So I put it into the hands of all these characters to do it for me. Now, folks, again, the title of the book, The Last Shade Tree, It's by my guest today, Margaret Panofsky, and I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I did. Thank you so much. 